All right. Well, this is the portion of our service that we set aside every Sunday to look at Bible prophecy. We here at Calvary Chapel Kaneohe believe that we're living in the last days, really the last moments of world history as we know it, and that the next event on God's prophetic clock is the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. For today, I've uh, taken the time to organize the update into three sections because I want to do something a little bit different than what we usually do. Uh, First, we're going to look at the Middle East geopolitically. Then second, we're going to revisit the United States economically. And then third, we're going to talk about right here at home in Hawaii uh, a bit more personally. Uh, My hope is that in doing this this way, it might help all of us to gain a better biblical perspective in terms of what the future may hold and really the days that lie ahead. We are in those perilous times that the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit wrote to Timothy about. It is a very uh, astonishing, for lack of a better word, description in terms of the list that he uses to describe what the world will look like prior to the Lord's return in the rapture of his church. I want to begin with this Jewish World Review article from last Thursday, July 12th, by Victor Davis Hansen, titled, The World is Changing Minute by Minute. Here's some of what he had to say. We are witnessing a seismic shift in global affairs. The shakeup is a perfect storm of political, demographic, and technological change that will soon make the world, as we have known it for the last 30 years, almost unrecognizable. It's almost as if this guy has been reading off of my notes because (laughs) I have been talking about this week after week, but I believe with all my heart that with a stroke of the pen, a click of the mouse, if you prefer, overnight we can wake up to a world that has changed, the likes of which we have never witnessed before in the history of mankind. That's, a, I realize, a pretty provocative statement, but on the authority of God's prophetic word, we are told that this is what is in store for the world as we know it. Well, on Wednesday, July 11th, the day before the Jewish Review article, the Telegraph ran in, uh, an insightful blog in light of, and I'm sure you heard about this, the breaking news that Russia was sending a massive buildup of warships close in proximity to Syria, of all places. Uh, By the way, interesting, just parenthetically, uh, why are we surprised that all of a sudden now the whole world is concerned about these biological weapons, these weapons of mass destruction that Syria possesses? Where have they been for the last 10 years? I mean, really? I mean, is it not a foregone conclusion that one Saddam Hussein moved his weapons of mass destruction into Syria? Syria now possesses those weapons of mass destruction? And so now all of a sudden, the whole world is up in arms, no pun intended, with these weapons of mass destruction which Syria possesses, which is, by the way, why it is that the world is very careful about handling Syria the way they handled Libya. This is Isaiah 17. I know a prophecy you're most familiar with, at least I hope so anyway. It is a prophecy concerning Syria that it will, Damascus, the capital city, be brought to a ruinous heap. It will be destroyed in a day. I think we're on the verge, on the cusp of seeing that prophecy come to pass. Well, this blog was titled, Syria is to Russia 
what Israel is to America, not America to Israel. Make that distinction. Here's a couple of quotes from this Khan Coughlin who wrote the blog. He says, as if the Syrian crisis is not bad enough already, the decision by Russia's macho man president, Vladimir Putin, to dispatch a flotilla of warships and amphibious landing vessels to Syria is hardly likely to ease tensions. Personally, I have always been skeptical about any suggestion that the Russians were giving serious consideration to ditching their most important regional ally. Syria is to the Russians what Israel is to the Americans, a vital strategic ally that can be relied upon through thick and thin to defend and represent Moscow's interests at all times. To me, this further reinforces the notion that the prophecy in Isaiah 17 concerning the destruction of Damascus will take place prior to the fulfillment of the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 concerning Russia. The Battle of Gog, as we call it, this alliance of nations with Russia and Iran at the helm. So Syria is conspicuously absent from the Ezekiel prophecy. Why? Well, I think it's explained by the uh, Isaiah prophecy in chapter 17. That would certainly remove Syria from the prophetic equation. Well, in concert with the intensity of the Middle East geopolitically, I want to share with you two articles concerning the perilous plight of the United States economically. Uh, how many of you know that uh, we're not doing too well? Are we okay with that? Does that come as any surprise to anybody? Uh, can I take it a step further? Of course I can. <laughs> United States of America is bankrupt. We can't pay our bills. We've run up our credit card so much so we've extended our own credit limit beyond that which we're able to pay. It's to the point now where if you were to liquidate the entirety of the United States of America, I'm talking sell Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and sell them all on Craigslist, and then when you're done, sell Craigslist too, which I don't know if you could do that, but let's just say you can. You still, with all of these companies, Boeing with them, and all of these companies here at home in the United States of America, and you sold them all, you could not pay what we owe. We are insolvent. And it's just a matter of time. And again, we can go to bed one night, wake up the next morning to a world that is vastly different than the one we've known here in the U.S. Are you depressed? Okay, good. Some of you are thinking, man, I... Wow, Pastor J.D., that's so uplifting. <laughs> this first article was published by the Atlantic Wire last Saturday, July 7th, and I have the map pictured here. The article was titled, U.S. Declares the Largest Natural Disaster Area Ever Due to Drought. Here's an excerpt from the article. The blistering summer and ongoing drought conditions have prompted the U.S. Agriculture Department to declare a federal disaster area in more than 1,000 counties covering 26 states. That's almost one-third of all the counties in the United States, making it the largest disaster declaration ever made by the USDA. The declaration covers almost every state in the southern half of the continental U.S., from South Carolina in the east to California in the west. It also includes Colorado and Wyoming, which have been hit by devastating wildfires. I mean, it's like the United States of America has been burning to the ground, literally. Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, and Nebraska at all, the entirety of the mainland of the United States, like we need this now. This certainly doesn't help. I mean, it adds insult to injury, so to speak. The second article 
Again, should probably come as no surprise when we learn that San Bernardino now becomes the third California city in recent weeks to file for bank bankruptcy. This is an entire city. We're talking about a population of a couple 300,000 people. And this is a municipal bankruptcy where now the city cannot pay its bills. Well, this was Wednesday, July 11th, and the interesting thing is, is that now San Bernardino will join the California communities of Stockton and Mammoth Lakes in bankruptcy court. Now, what makes this so disturbing is that California is not alone. This is just the beginning. Can I say it this way? You ain't seen nothing yet. This is just the beginning of what I believe is going to be subsequently a number of cities that will file bankruptcy. They're on the brink. They cannot make their municipal payroll. One source was quoted as saying that over 100 U.S. cities are facing the same fears of bankruptcy as they attempt to keep budget payments with dwindling revenues due to unemployment rates. By the way, this unemployment rate, you hear the number eight, maybe nine, depending on where they're quoting it from. It's, that's a nebulous and meaningless uh, number. It has no basis in reality. The fact of the matter is, is that it's closer to, pro conservatively, to probably about 20%. That means two out of, uh, out of every 10 Americans are unemployed, unable to find work. Well, that has a, uh, you know, a trickle-down effect in that it affects the revenues from taxes, and when you have the revenues from taxes that are affected, then cities can't pay their bills. And then when cities can't pay their bills, then states can't pay their bills. And when states can't pay their bills, then the United States can't pay its bills. And then the dollar crashes. And then that's it. How are we doing? Everybody okay? Why are you looking at me like that? Wow. <laughs> Listen, let's round the corner bring it closer to home here in our, our beloved Hawaii. Um, I'm going to do this by way of a blog again that I happened upon last week uh, so as to depress you even more. Uh, I'll read a small portion of it uh, to you. It uh, reads, sometimes it can be easy to forget that behind all of the horrible economic numbers that we hear about are millions of real people that have had their lives absolutely devastated by this economy. Elderly couples are being brutally evicted from their homes. Young families are living in their cars. Terminally ill people are dying because they cannot afford medication that they need, and millions of parents can't sleep at night as they wrestle with anxiety over not being able to provide for their children. Often, those that lose their jobs or their homes discover that people start looking at them very differently and that there's a, a really a very little compassion out there these days. One major U.S. bank is even kicking an elderly woman with stage four breast cancer out of her home because she cannot make her full mortgage payment each month. When the next major, major global financial catastrophe happens, we're going to see a whole lot more economic despair. I want to ask you a question. Do you think that things could get better? I mean, certainly we want for things to get better. We would certainly hope things would get better. But do you really believe that things are going to get better? The Bible says they're not. That things are going to get worse. And I really believe that we are on the verge of seeing things deteriorate at a rate, the likes of which, again, we've never seen before. Okay. <laughs> right about now, you're probably asking yourself, why is today's prophecy update riddled with such gloom and doom? 
Well, the reason is, is so that we'll all just throw up our hands in total despair. Let's close in prayer. I'm just kidding, sort of. Let me explain. To some degree, it's a good thing that we're brought to despair. How so? Well, it's a good thing when it has the effect of loosening our grip on this world, the things of this world. See, when I can no longer put my hope in this world, it forces me to revisit the next world, the world to come, eternity. And that's a good thing. And the reason being is that the hopelessness and the despair in this world will serve as a catalyst in forcing us to realize how close we are to the end of the world. I really believe that we are at the end. And actually, this is the first of three practical responses for you note takers. You can write these down. Three, not exhaustive, but three practical responses that we as believers in Jesus Christ must have in this last hour of mankind's history. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 18. The Apostle John writes, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. That's the litmus test. That's the gauge by which you know that we are in the last hour of human history. The second practical response in this last hour is to occupy our time with the things of God, not the things of the world. Why? So we're as ready for the rapture now as we'd be if the rapture weren't for another 10 years from now. I personally don't believe that we have another 10 years I could be wrong. Don't think I'm wrong. We don't know the day or the hour. No man can know the day or the hour, but we can know that it's very close, nay, even at the door. Now, make no mistake about it. We need to occupy until he comes. We need to loosen our grip on this world before he comes. It doesn't mean that we don't, you know, have things or do things. It's just that we don't let those things have us. It's not what you have, it's what has you. I have long-range plans because I want to be as ready for the rapture if it were another 10 years from now as I would be if it were today. So I hold on to my plans with open fist not clenched fist. I hold on to them very loosely, for I know not when the trumpet will sound. I don't want those things to have me. I don't want the roots deep into this world and the things of this world to so occupy my time, sap my energy. I want my time occupied with the things of God. I want to be busy about the things of God. I want to be busy about the kingdom of God. Listen to what Luke 19 verses 11 through 13 says. 
And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Do you realize that God has given you one at least? Maybe more at best? Don't you want to be found faithful with that which he's given you? Well, pastor, you're the pastor. I'm just, you know... I'm just a, you know, unknown Christian. I'm just a normal person. Are you saying I'm not normal? <laughs> anyway, sorry. Well, don't you think that God wants to take the ordinary and do the extraordinary? Don't you know that God chooses the foolish of this world to confound the wise? Just look at me. <laughs> you should see my resume. I don't actually have one. It's really impressive. Why would God choose to use someone like me? Because there's no way that I could ever, even if I wanted to, take the credit for what God's doing. He's just going to look at me and say, man, if God can use someone like him, he can surely use someone like me. And that's true. And he's given you at least one talent to use for his kingdom. Do it. Be found faithful doing it. Here's our third and final one. It's simply this. It's to get right with the Lord and to live right for the Lord. How? By making the most of every opportunity that He presents to you as He empowers you by the Holy Spirit. This is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Ephesus. He says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a final thought. I'll pose it as a question. How peculiar are we to the world when instead of drowning our sorrows to forget our problems by getting drunk, we're filled with the Holy Spirit instead, singing joyful songs and thanking God with that joy of the Lord? Let me ask the same question a different way. Have you ever had someone want that joy and peace that you have? when everything in the world is falling apart and everything in the world is falling apart. This last week I had the privilege of doing two weddings, one of which was a first. It was a uh, pastor. Uh, I had never performed a, a wedding ceremony for a pastor. I was a little nervous, you know, just I gave him my notes to make sure everything met with his approval first. <laughs> and then he was from the mainland. And then uh, this other wedding was from a, a couple here in our fellowship, but, uh, which was yesterday. And uh, for the first time, I never had this happen before. You know, usually the, the pastor's up front first, then, you know, the groomsmen come in, the groom's there, and then the anticipation is building. And usually the pastor at that point will have, you know, the wedding guests stand before the entrance of the bride. And something happened yesterday has never happened before. And it wasn't just because of, you know, who they were or the wedding as it, as it were. It's just I think it was from the Lord and from the Holy Spirit just really speaking to my heart. Because when she walked in, I mean, it was like air stopped. 
And I always like to look at the groom when he first beholds his bride. <laughs> Guys, do you remember? Do you remember? I have yet to see a bride walk down that aisle with a frown. Could you imagine? I mean, my God. She, the sparkle, the brightness, the joy, the tears of joy. And she's walking down there, and I mean chicken skin, and the wedding guests, and the grooms. And then the groomsmen are like, yeah. Yeah, you know, some of them are single. They're thinking, man, I wish I, you know. Anyway, and the bridesmaids, oh, I wish that were me. I mean, it's just all of the dynamics in the room at the time are just powerful. And the Lord spoke to me in that still, small voice at that very moment. And he said, capture this moment. I said, Lord, this is good. Too high for my understanding. How glorious. He said, it's not even a... We have a word in Arabic, and I... It's not... It doesn't even... It's, it, it's not even a... I, I don't even have the word in English, but... You have no idea what it's going to be like for you. My bride. Oh, I actually started to tear up. It's not good when the pastor needs Kleenex. <laughs> it's usually the bride. But I looked over at the groom as he beheld his bride. And I thought, Lord, what's it going to be like for you as our groom when you behold us as the bride? Why do I point this out? Because that's what Paul is talking about here. Do you realize? <laughs> We've got a wedding coming up. How exciting. The world around us is falling apart, but yet there should be that joy that marks us as his bride. It's so contagious. It's so contagious. Listen, at a wedding, People, when they come to a wedding, they forget about everything because of the wedding, do they not? Because of the joyfulness of the moment of that wedding. That's what our future holds. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I cannot offer you that. This is only for those who are born again of the Spirit of God, which we're going to talk about in detail in our study in Romans here shortly. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will not know him as your bridegroom. Now, I'm asked often, well, what about those that are left behind? Is there still hope for them after the rapture, during the tribulation, to give their lives to Christ? There is but make no mistake about it. If you're not going to live for Christ prior to the rapture and the tribulation, what makes you think that you're going to be willing to die for Christ in the tribulation? Because that's what's going to happen. And, and furthermore, I'll take it a step further. Not only that, but if you are numbered amongst one of those tribulation saints saying to yourself, well, I'm just going to kind of wait, check it out, you know, maybe last minute, you know, I'll party now and then right before it's too late, I'll accept. How's that working out for you? Are you kidding me? It's going to be in the twinkling of an eye. You won't have time. It'll be too late. But let's just say you're left behind. You're not going to be the bride. The bride is taken up before the tribulation. We have a distinction that's made in the book of Revelation. The servants, the tribulation saints will be serving at the throne, but we as the bride will be seated with our bridegroom on the throne. Don't you want to be the bride? Listen, I'm watching that bride walk down. Now. I want to be the bride. I want to be the bride. Okay, pastor, what do I do? 
Well, it's actually very simple. It's childlike simple, maybe too simple. It's simply calling out to the Lord and calling upon the name of the Lord. Confessing, I am a sinner. I need you as my Savior. I accept your payment in full for my sin. And when you do that, in that instant, the Holy Spirit indwells you, enables you to live a holy life, and you're a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. And from that day forward, you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, and you're rapture-ready, and you're heaven-bound, so that when that trumpet sounds, you will be caught up in the twinkling of an eye, putting off corruptible and putting on incorruptible, and you'll be in the presence of the Lord. And I happen to believe that that day is very soon. And it could be today, because there's nothing that has to happen before the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. One last thing. I know I said that three last things to go, so this will be the last of the last. This is my final closing, so here, here it is. <laughs> I'm often asked, Per 1 Thessalonians, where Paul says that, you know, the man of perdition, this Antichrist, cannot be revealed until the church is raptured. And some think that we're going to see who the Antichrist is. That's not true. The Antichrist, who is alive and well on planet Earth today, behind the scenes, cannot be revealed until we're removed from the scene. That is a fact on the authority of God's word. And please be a Berean and search the scriptures for yourself and see if this be so. Never take my word for it. Okay? Everybody all right? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Bible prophecy. Thank you for the urgency and the excitement that it can create within our hearts. Lord, thank you that it has the effect of loosening our grip on this world and readying us and steadying us for our life with you in eternity in the next world. Lord, I would pray for any here today who don't know you or aren't sure if they are saved, that today, before they leave this church, it would be the day of their salvation. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.